हेलो यस मैम Uh, you let me know when I can start, huh? and I will be sharing the uh, PPT. Okay. Okay. Uh, am I audible and visible now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um. So, sir, can we start? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. we can. Okay. Uh, just let's just check if uh, my voice is uh is this spacing okay? Is there a lag or anything? Just let no, me know. No lag. Okay. I'm I'm good to go. We can start. Okay. I would like to have the first page, like the main page of the PPT, as we do okay. the introduction. Okay. Okay. So okay. I'll Chalo, ready. First, and then we'll begin. Right? Okay. 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 Yeah. So on a count of uh, three, we'll start. Okay. On the count of okay. three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we want to run through the PPT once, or is it fine? Ah, uh, okay. We can do that. One second. Yeah. Is it visible? Yeah, it is. Are there any videos in the PPT? No, there are no videos, only images. Okay, then it will work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you are ready, then I will give the count and then we can start. Okay. Take it. Oh, uh, one. I stop screen sharing one minute. Yeah. 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 Okay. One, two, three, start. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to another session here on Physio TV. I am Dr. Rucha Rayas, uh, Assistant Professor here at uh, Cardiovascular and Physiotherapy uh, Department of uh, Sancheti Institute College of Physiotherapy. And I take pleasure in introducing our speaker for today. Uh, a very warm welcome to you. We have with us Dr. Bhakti Sagaukar. Uh, Ma'am has completed her graduation followed by post-graduation in Neurophysiotherapy from St. GS Medical College and KM Hospital, Mumbai. She is a certified pediatric NDT practitioner and has been into pediatric physiotherapy since the past seven years. Uh, currently, she is the head physiotherapist at uh, Vishwa Balak Kendra, uh, which is um, uh, situated in Nerur. It is an institute for differently abled, underprivileged, abandoned children. And she also has her own clinical practice at Sanpada Navi Mumbai. Um, very recently, this Women's Day, ma'am, was awarded the Mrs. Physio Maharashtra Award by uh, IAP's Women's Cell. Congratulations for that. And uh, we are extremely happy to have you with us today. And ma'am will be speaking about a topic that is very close to her heart, which is early intervention in pediatric physiotherapy. So ma'am, whenever you are ready, we can begin with the session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rucha, for this uh, wonderful introduction. So before we begin our talk today, I would like to thank my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Rucha Raya, uh, and the entire team of Sancheti College of Physiotherapy for giving me this opportunity to have this discussion with you all. Uh, as she said rightly, uh, early intervention has been something which is very, very close to my heart because even since my student years, I always noticed that whenever there was an adult or a, a pediatric patient with neuro damage, it was always treated like a life sentence that, okay, now there are going to be some residual damages. Now the patient has to live with it. And there was a lot of negativity surrounding that patient or no, not much hope for his or her brighter future. So I was always intrigued by that concept because no matter, uh, though there may be some truth in the residual damages of a neurological injury, but still those patients are surviving and they have as much of a right to deserve a good quality of life as any other patient. So I was always very much interested in how we as physiotherapists can specifically improve their quality of life. That is when I came across uh, the concept of early intervention, that early uh, awareness about intervention, the need for early screening, recognition, sometimes even prevention, and that can lead to such better results now. So uh, I will mostly be sticking to pediatric physiotherapy in this talk. But yes, early intervention is important and it gives great results in both peds and adults. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's begin. Can we have the first slide? Yeah, 
So the objectives for today's session are, we will have a quick overview of what early intervention basically is, who benefits from it, who are the candidates who require early intervention, how can we assess and screen them at an appropriate time to begin our intervention as early as possible. Then we will go on to setting goals in a neurological patient followed by a small case study of a pediatric CP child. Then uh, after this is over, we can take a few questions. Please next. So early intervention comprises of comprehensive, structured, holistic healthcare services, nursing care, education and support provided to the infants and toddlers with diagnosed developmental delays and those who are at a risk of potential delays under the age of five years. Now, please note the importance of each term in this definition. It is a comprehensive and collective and holistic approach. So it is not just physiotherapy or any one faculty which is being involved in providing early intervention services. It's a team of professionals which provide and each of them contributes something different to the management of the patient. They bring their own expertise to the table to give the patient, uh, which is in our case, a pediatric, uh, the infant or a toddler, multidimensional development. Okay, uh, some texts mention early intervention up to the age of three years, but here I would like to notice a point that um, the importance of the educational aspect of it, because it is not restricted, early intervention is not restricted only to uh, the neurological damage. It also is used in neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism, ADHD, where we have learning disabilities also as a component. So to include the schooling and preschooling part of it, I have included the definition of up to five years. The EI team consists of the medical team, which uh, consists of the neonatologist, the main medical uh, pediatrician, obstetrician, gynecologist um, as, as that part. Then there is the nursing team, the therapy team, which consists of speech therapist, occupational therapist, physiotherapist. Then there are psychological counselors because you are not just treating the child, you are also associated with their family members. And through this process, there is a lot of psychological impact that they all go through. So we need support and uh, concerned care for them as well. Next. Okay, so uh, the scope and benefits of early intervention. Uh, it has been shown through literature that the first four years of life are very, very dynamic in any child's, uh, uh, child's life. So for the first four years, there is high neuroplastic potential. For a child who has been identified to have a condition, let's take for an example, cerebral palsy. If there are certain perinatal events which predispose a child to have cerebral palsy and we start treating the child as early as possible, it is possible to improve the neuroplasticity in them to such an extent that the negative effects of neurological stress, that is um, the primitive patterns or the synergistic patterns can be prevented from developing. Because it is important to know that unlearning a wrong pattern is more difficult than promoting the uh, learning of a new pattern altogether. So if there is a negative pattern which has already been set and the child comes to us for therapy at a later age, say four years or five years, by that time, already there has been a lot of negative stress that the nervous system has been placed under. And uh, because of this, they are set in certain ways of movement and posture, which becomes difficult more and more as we go ahead in life. So preventing delays in all domains, namely physical, cognitive, language and social functioning. I will specifically speaking about the physiotherapy aspect of it. But other professionals are equally, if not more important, in case-to-case -case condition. So in physiotherapy, mainly what we work is, we work on improving the activation of muscles. Like, um, say, as I mentioned, cerebral palsy. If we have a global delay in multiple areas of the brain, so the child may be very inactive right from the NICU stage. So we have to start giving them stimulation so that all the joints are mobile and the child can at least passively experience how movement feels because if left to their own devices 
they may not start moving much later till much later dates so we have to facilitate the development of milestones right from uh, uh, the early days of infancy then by doing this we are also targeting the musculoskeletal system prevent Uh, am i audible hello yes you are audible can can you hear me still there was some disturbance yes you are audible go ahead okay i'll go ahead so as i was saying uh, by doing early intervention we are working on the musculoskeletal system in such a way that we are not allowing the formation of deformities the setting in of tightnesses in the muscles all those things we are targeting from a preventive perspective at the same time we are also uh, helping to develop the infant's cardio pulmonary fitness we are preventing the deconditioning effects of just lying down in a particular position and we are moving them through the developmental milestones in different capacities of assistance like sometimes it can be a little passive in the beginning stages then you reduce your input to gradually go on to active assisted movements so on and so forth by doing early intervention we are modulating their neuroplasticity by forming correct synaptic connections and pruning the negative synaptic connections from happening okay next uh, can we have the next slide yeah so identifying delays how do we identify who needs early intervention therapy Uh, so it can happen at multiple levels right from the antenatal period if certain mothers are known to have certain genetic conditions themselves or in their nearest family members or if they have had a history of complicated pregnancies from beforehand uh, we can identify them as a high risk pregnancy and pay more monitoring and more attention to see how they are progressing each trimester if they have certain comorbid comorbidities like diabetes thyroid disorders hypertension automatically it predisposes the infant to certain um, difficulties and that's why it is important to monitor them right from the antenatal period itself then comes the perinatal period which is again filled with so many variables that you have to strictly control the environment in an already identified high risk mother so in the infancy there can be uh, complications in the birthing process itself then ca there can be hyperbilirubinemia many many different uh, things that can go wrong there can be uh, the commonest cases generally the child does not cry immediately after birth there is a rupture of placenta which causes hypoxic damage to the brain during that process of child birth so in such cases we assume that there may be certain uh, damage that has occurred to the brain and in that case we have to counsel the parents about the need of observing the child and how they are progressing uh, thereafter then if these both events uh, like the antenatal period and the perinatal period go smoothly we also at every pediatric visit uh, certain delays can be observed we can see that the age of the child and the developmental age of the child are matching or not are they developing motor milestones speech and all so how do uh, these identification processes take place it's when we will be armed with information uh, armed with awareness all the practitioners right from the uh, medical team right from the primary health care centers all of them if they are armed with this information they will be quick to pick up things which are out of the ordinary or the things which are not yet developing according to the age sometimes the families wait a very long time for the child to gain milestones and many a times kids do develop at different ages some some kids there is a window period of say 2 to 3 months where we can wait and some kids learn at a different level but at the same time it has to be kept in mind that if a lot of period has passed and the child is not able to achieve a particular thing you need to get it evaluated because a healthcare professional is at a better stage to understand if there are certain delays which need intervention or it can resolve on its own so the families can observe this and i mentioned a point previously about learning disabilities so some uh, kids 
like they are picked up in school that they are not learning as the other kids maybe they are not paying attention or they are taking time so the teachers also at times are able to spot certain patterns in kids and then after uh, evaluating we find out that okay the child is having a learning disability physically appearance wise there may not be any gross abnormality but still they need that uh, other support from the early intervention professionals it can be special educators or shadow teachers it can be sometimes speech therapists so that is needed and not just physiotherapy so all it's a multidisciplinary comprehensive approach we are looking at the child as an individual as a whole and not just in parts which are relevant to our specialty so even if as a physiotherapist i see a child who is around 2 to 3 years and still not speaking i will do my best to counsel the parent to take appropriate help from at least a developmental pediatrician and then the speech therapist and go accordingly so we need to have this knowledge to help the child and the family better and uh, as i said the first four years are very very crucial yes changes do occur later on also but if we target the child in these first four years the fast improvement can be seen okay next okay so we use certain assessment and screening tools so after we identify a child having a potential problem there are certain assessments which can be made to document and uh, quantify the problem or issue at hand so let's take again cerebral palsy for an for example we see there are gross motor damage uh, that occurs in cerebral palsy in the various types so we have certain gross motor assessment scales such as bailey's infant motor development we have a functional measure which is gross motor function measure gmfm then we have a manual ability classification system which is a scale which classifies the hand function stage of the child so these things can be done at various age groups so for 0 to 2 years we do the gross motor assessment after the age of 2 years we do a gross motor classification uh, and these scales help us to set a particular goal they can be repeated periodically to monitor what improvement has occurred after doing the scale for the first time and by the time we do a repeat assessment then there is uh, something known as a sensory profile in seemingly normal kids who don't have any obvious physical impairment sometimes we do find out sensory processing disorder especially kids who are prematurely born or kids who are born with a low birth weight though they don't have uh, don't have a suffered neurological damage they may show certain sensory traits or characteristics which prevent them from reaching their full functional potential they may show certain changes in their activities of daily living they are not able to cope with the pressures of school so in such kids a sensory profile also helps us to know which sensory systems are at a problem and how can we integrate them to improve the child's functioning so that also uh, can be done then a routine visual and hearing assessment is very very recommended in general for all the kids uh, even those who are not affected because these are the things vision and hearing are the primary motivators for a child to learn about his surrounding about his or her environment so a visual and ophthalmic screening to just determine their level of functioning is recommended for almost every kid i would recommend then if there are any special uh, systemic evaluations that need to be done for the heart the pulmonary system or the digestive system those relevant systemic examinations can be done right uh, at the early stage next okay so now we have identified a particular infant having a problem we have done the relevant assessment and found to uh, have a list of impairments that the child is suffering from now how do we go about setting a particular goal for that child so um, as a ndt therapist that is a neuro developmental treatment therapist what we do is we form certain goals they can be divided into a long term goal short term goal and also goals for every session all these goals have to be s m a r t for smart goals we will go through each of the uh, acronym uh, letters from the acronym smart stands for specific measurable attainable realistic and time bound so uh, i will explain this with an example i have a child who is an 8 year old boy with crouch gait 
okay so um, what my long term goal for him is right now he is walking with support with a crouch gait my eventual long term goal is that his crouch should reduce the gait pattern should become a little better now if i just state this very arbitrarily i have not really specified what i want so it will be difficult for me to say if i have achieved it or not so if i make this goal very specific what i will say is uh, in terms of specificity i will mention what the current range at the joint is i i can say he is at a hip knee flexion angle of so and so uh, then i can also mention that he is currently walking with support so if i want to see a long term change in his crouch how much level of assistance i am allowing him or um that comes with experience again but i'll say okay his hip knee flexion angle should reduce he should walk more upright in an upright position with support so i have to describe the goal and be specific in my conditions of that goal being achieved then measurable so just saying he will walk with an upright posture walk for how long for what distance in is it an indoor or an outdoor goal so we have to have a measurable quantity we have to uh, specify the duration and a certain parameter needs to be set is it attainable or not now right now i am seeing that child walk uh, with a, a crouch gait so if i suddenly put a running or a hopping as a goal for him it will be too much right now it is not attainable nor is it realistic so the term realistic also is uh, related to having a meaningful goal for that child so if that child wants to play with kids of a certain age in the playground if i set a goal of more walking with lesser support i think that will be more realistic and hold more meaning for him so that he can match up with his peers rather than i me giving him a very very far fetched goal which is not realistic for him will demotivate him and his family further then time bound in how much duration do i expect this goal be achieved so that comes with certain experience and there are times when you overestimate the child or overestimate your own uh, ability to gain that goal in that particular duration but it is important in the beginning to establish certain parameters so you can yourself cross check later on of how far you have come from that goal okay so each of the goals be it a long term one a short term one or a session goal needs to fit into this smart criteria i think that is a more effective way of setting goals now long term goals as i said improving the gait pattern it is a multi system goal because we are working on the posture and movement gait is a complex activity now if i want to achieve that i will need to divide it into some smaller goals and focus on one particular system so crouch only uh, crouch gait for example we know that the child has crouch gait so we have to identify which single systems are responsible for it is it the tightness in the musculoskeletal system is it the joint mobility which is reduced in the musculoskeletal system or the spasticity component is too high which comes under the neuromuscular system so when i break that long term goal into smaller goals and i target these specific systems by small taking small steps then i will ultimately reach my long term goal and again to achieve the short term goals we uh, divide it into further session wise goals so in every session we start with a pre and a post test that gives us a better idea about how sorry the child has fared in that particular session okay next please okay so now that we have a set goal in mind we will go about the intervention approach so now in the intervention approach as you can see i have again created an acronym actually not i have not created it it is uh, found from various studies that we use this intervention approach which is more family centered and child centered in its being so the child is not just a passive participant in the therapy process he is as much as an active involved uh, entity as is the therapist as is the family and the supporting members so it has to be goal oriented so our smart goal has to be ready on which we will be working at that point it has to be active the child has to be participating in it it is an active motor task this specifically because i am talking about physiotherapy so i am choosing either a gross or a fine motor task for it 
and enriching the environment so the environment has to be conducive to doing that particular therapy part so many a times what happens is if i am attached to the vishwabalak kendra so it is an organization where we deal with orphan kids so what happens is many a times like everything is in place but that one on one attention which the child needs is not there uh, let me explain this with an example that there was one child who was absolutely fine like we had done his early screening he was a 3 month old with no neurological damage he was a term baby no risk factors no prematurity so anything in his history that was available to us didn't predispose him to any condition still he had a tendency of looking only on one side there was no uh, torticollis we took him to the ortho we saw but the range restriction remained because he always preferred to look at one side we evaluated the ophthal uh, ophthalmic evaluation also and it was clear that there was nothing wrong with the vision nothing wrong with the brain nothing wrong with the neck still the child kept looking at one side and on a series of observations from my side i noted that he was always placed in the crib in such a way that the side to which he turned was the one where there were other kids where the staff used to come and go and the window was placed and the opposite side was the wall because his crib was close to the wall so just the fact that all activities happening only on one side made that child keep looking at the side and he developed a little bit of tightness in the neck that was it there was nothing other than this contextual factor so what we did is we turned his crib in such a way that he will start looking the other way and believe me in just a week we started noticing that the child was moving his neck to both the side so just a simple task we didn't have to do any stretching strengthening anything yes we did actively but just that change in environment uh, helped us achieve what we really needed so uh, the importance of the interaction of the environment also becomes important the contextual factors of having that one on one attention on a particular child because they need it infants need it more than adults so sometimes that is lacking in an institute like ours unfortunately it is uh, like they are still doing the best that they can but just that one part of human touch and that single uh, observation and interaction help him next okay so this is another case study which i want to uh, share so he is again a boy he is now 2 year old with uh, spastic cerebral palsy he came to our institute when he was 2 month old he actually was abandoned by his birth mother because she was a minor i have not included the details because we need to respect their confidentiality so he was born to an unmarried uh, minor mother who uh, had a traumatic pregnancy the baby had to be delivered pre term due to certain uh, complications in the maternal health factor and uh, because of which he was delivered at 29.4 weeks he was very low birth weight he had neonatal respiratory distress being premature the pulmonary system was also a bit underdeveloped he had rubella infection he developed retinopathy he lost vision uh, grade three. he lost his vision in the right eye luckily we were able to spare some vision in the left side so he can now see with corrective glasses in the uh, like from the left eye he can still see he had a seizure on day 1 and day 4 of life uh, because of the rubella syndrome it affected his hearing he has moderate hearing loss in both the ears the baby used to as a 2 month old he was brought to our center and he used to only cry he was very irritable he was poorly taking feeds he used to uh, get hypoxic spells even on crying even while feeding from the bottle he was not taking to the bottle so he used to get breathless while taking bottle feel he had to feel he had to take breaks uh, just to rule out any cardiac complications his uh, cardiac all uh, screenings were done so uh, an early intervention was started we started treating the child at 2 months of life with our primary focus being reducing his uh, respiratory difficulties we worked a lot on his rib cage uh, please next slide so we just started by stabilizing stabilizingly working on his breathing so i was not very concerned at that time with his motor milestones i knew he had a deficit and his mri was pending at that point but we from his history itself we could 
understand that there would be certain abnormalities which would be picked up by the mri later on but right now our target was to stabilize him clinically improving his respiratory capacity reducing the secretions he used to fall ill recurrently there was lower respiratory infections he was more prone to that so with therapy our initial smart goal was just to improve his respiratory capacity so gradually when we started working on that we simultaneously found that his hand movements started improving after getting stabilized after just giving good positioning the baby started to lift his head so gradually with time we were able to uh, simultaneously as i said we were working on joint mobility but he was more a passive participant initially and our main target was improving the respiration Uh, then as the baby developed to four months, five months, other uh, therapists also joined in the process. Like once his uh, he crossed the six month mark, we wanted to introduce uh, other feeding to it. So speech therapy in his case was predominantly related to his not the speech but his feeding issues. Then op- occupational therapist was working on his visual stimulation, on integrating the visual sense, whatever. Um, vision was paired in the left eye we wanted to target that and use that in helping the baby to learn movements he eventually covered all his milestones with a gap of say 2 to 3 months which is not much considering the presentation that he had at birth so with uh, uh, let's say 2 to 4 months we found that his um, milestones started getting achieved the quality of movement became better he started holding his head at 4 months standing at 12 months and walking at 15 months right now the boy is 2 year old and he is walking independently he can climb stairs with certain support at the hand but yes he needs close supervision because the fear of fall has not completely gone away so uh, but it is reduced than before uh, he is able to follow single step commands with now the speech therapists are working more on developing his speech the hearing is, loss is moderate but it is still conducive to development of speech though there are certain delays in it and we are working on it so this was our great success story of early intervention in our center that we had okay next this is the boy 2 year old you can see from the pictures that he is walking uh, without support he eats finger foods on his own and uh, like we have been able to get him close to his like uh, his developmental age is getting closer to his chronological age every day as he improves thank you um, if any questions are there i'll be happy to take them uh, right okay so um, is it okay if i stop sharing the ppt yeah that's okay if uh, you can uh, put the next slide it's the reference slide if you want okay Okay. Yeah, these are my references. Right. So, thank you so much. Uh, it was an extremely informative talk. I personally got to learn a lot of things, and I think early intervention pediatric physiotherapy. Um, there are a lot of uh, you know misconceptions about several aspects of this uh, field of physiotherapy, and I think your talk was um, not just informative. I would say equally motivational as well. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you gave us examples of cases that you have personally come across and what actually can be achieved through early intervention. So thank you very much. Uh, there are a few questions that I would like to ask you. Um, my first question is more about. Uh, so every time we think in terms of involving the parents in uh, physiotherapy, right? Because we will have a certain session with the child which lasts for. a small duration of time the rest of the time parents are supposed to take over so a lot of times we come across questions asked from their end in terms of will my child walk when will my child walk um so how do you go about uh, dealing with such kind of queries okay that, that's actually a very very important question dr rucha and uh, to certain extent that is also a very heart breaking uh, question because many a times the real answer is The, that your child may never move on uh, if you remember in the assessment slide i mentioned certain classification systems so as a, a therapist now as a pediatric therapist now i know that uh, there are certain 
conditions like the extent of damage is so severe that by the time the child is one or two year old we know that what their gross motor classification system is so there are i'll uh, it's actually out of the scope of this uh, this thing but i'll quickly just explain that scale to you so the gross motor function classification system scale that scale consists of five stages in those stages uh, it is uh, specifically uh, used for pp population so in that the scale mentions that uh, the kids from grade 1 to 5 are in the increasing level of severity of damage so the grade 4 and 5 will always be confined to a wheelchair when they grow older and they are never ambulators okay only grades 1 to 3 are the ones so the extent of damage is such that if you label a child as gmfcs grade 1 to 3 Uh, the child will be an ambulator grade 1 and 2 are independent ambulators with certain deviations as i mentioned crouch and everything grade 3 generally require an assistive device and that too up to the age of uh, teenage years so after growth it is possible that they may lose their ability and slip down one grade to grade 4 and 4 and 5 are the most severely involved uh, kids who are almost always confined to a wheelchair and they need help with transition so as early as say 3 or 4 month old also sometimes experienced therapists can determine that this child is going to be a grade 4 or a grade 5 so the honest answer is no your child may never walk but seeing the scenario seeing the family many a times it will be heartbreaking to deliver the news then and there so it is also a process like you have to take the parents on that journey and give them small as i said a long term goal for them is walking but they don't understand it because a one one and a half year old is walking so for them it feels like okay if i do therapy for a year maybe my child will start walking but it is not realistic for that child it is not specific it is not attainable for that child but what you have to show is you have to beautifully also explain lots of strengths of that child now the case study which i mentioned if you see his history there are so many factors which are just extremely negative like forget about the perinatal events just the fact that he was born to a minor mother who had a lot of trauma in her antenatal period you know that the child is having so much of a baggage which he carried from the womb to the outside now world and he is struggling but if you see him at two year marks he has he has wonderfully picked up so uh, again what we have to be is we have to always uh, tell the parents that look at the small term goals right now we will focus In in this view, because it is important to gain their trust to not stop therapy, because a child who is a grade one or two can slip lower uh, to lower grades if they don't receive intervention at all. So what is important is you have to explain to the parent that your ch- child, we are helping him to achieve his or her maximum potential with therapy, with all these multidisciplinary care that I spoke about. but you don't have to always compare him with a normal parameter because even a grade 1 child who is independently walking a hemiplegic cp for example who is independently walking running playing he also will have certain deviations which separate him from normal but you have to explain to the parent show the beauty of those kids and the things that they can do focusing on the strengths because trust me i've been working with all uh, these type of kids for the past 7 years they have immense strengths which are get often overlooked because of the more obvious physical impairment that they present with so and when the parent learns it see there will be a stage of denial for the parents initially which is understandable but as few months pass and they see more and more they see these small improvements no then they also start finding it and then they start finding their happiness back with the child and it's a win win situation all over because as i said i don't want this neurological damage to be like a life sentence imposed on that child we want to strive for better quality of life right from the beginning itself okay. yeah right in fact i think the way you mentioned that focusing on what the child already can do um, or what their strengths are can help to gain parents confidence and probably that um, in fact uh, helps to i guess improve their regularity with uh, sessions maybe improves follow up also yes. right yes. um one more question w- was how exactly is uh, pediatric physiotherapy different from uh, the interventions that we do for adults oh great great uh, that's a good point dr rucha because uh, most important with a child is forming a rapport 
see adults can follow instructions to certain extent even adults with stroke uh, unless there is a major cognitive impact that they have had or a perceptual deficit that they have had most of the times they are with you okay uh, two important points i'll mention in the differences between adult and pediatric neuro rehab so the first point is the level of cooperation uh, an adult is coming from a stage of maturity a stage of understanding of their impairment and why we are doing therapy for what particular reason so they are with us on the same page though they may also go through levels of frustration sometimes but at least they are more or less aware and cooperative they will follow command whereas a child you just cannot explain to them why you are doing a certain thing so forming that rapport and being a child yourself to you know get into their zone is very important so the level of cooperation you don't do things to a child you do things with a child you are not as i said the game intervention mentions the child has to be an active participant in the process you are not just subjecting them to something it is just inhuman so it is better to form that rapport and the way of approaching it is child centered child directed play or play therapy intervention okay the second most important point in this is in an adult who has say suffered a stroke or he has had a head injury the most common causes of, of uh, getting neurological damage or an infective injury let's say to the brain or the spinal cord in that case at least for a few years up to the point of that event they have experienced what normal is and after that event they have lost a part of it or major parts of it so to some extent they have experienced what is normal and now they have regressed to a more primitive level of um, movement or posture but in a child who is born with a certain condition they have never had the opportunity to experience normal because they are growing with that level of damage so the way they are growing the way they will be improving or developing is going to be a little out of the ordinary i don't like to use the word abnormal a lot but it is out of what normal is so that's why early intervention is more important because if we start early and we can start as early as day one of life okay like we work in the nicu as well provided the infant's medical condition is stable the child is uh, hemodynamically stable the parameters are uh, well managed and maintained we can start as early as day one of life so assuming what damage can be uh, encountered later if we start early we are promoting the positive and normal patterns of movement right then and there so the earlier we start always the better it will be so that child has never experienced something and lost it he has never gone through the normal process so that's why in pediatrics it becomes even more mandatory to start early yeah right um one last question uh, you mentioned about smart goals right yes. and uh, goal setting is equally important for every session so um, are there any because most of the outcome measures that we come across in pediatrics are very comprehensive or time taking also right yes. so are there any simple outcomes that you can use say maybe for single session goals which are easy to even demonstrate to the parents for that matter that what kind of progress is being seen in the child yeah so uh, i actually like the gmfm so uh, an overview again of a, of the gmfm scale is na it mentions a certain like sitting standing it is for from the uh, age 0 onwards you can use the gmfm so usme uh, you have head control you have um, rolling then uh, sitting then you have kneeling and standing and walking so these components and under those components there are many many small subsets which uh, can be so you can use a one subset of that as your session goals for a week say because you cannot achieve that in just one uh, session as such but you can have a series of session which are doing modifications of that one particular goal so for example if the child is sitting and after he has achieved sitting now he wants to move out of sitting as a transition so if he is sitting and reaching out to his right in a ring sitting position so reaching for a toy and picking it up on his right can be a goal for that one session so for that also if i break that down into multi and single system so the gross goal will be just reaching out of the base of support and picking up a toy but for that i need to have the muscle flexibility of upper extremities i need to have ranges at my shoulder at my this thing i need to have activation of my postural muscles of the trunk so that he doesn't topple over or he may topple over it so if he topples over he'll learn another part of it which is 
correcting himself protecting the head so when you work on one goal simultaneously many other things which you are not actively working for get achieved at times sometimes you are just surprised so the pediatric therapy is just full of surprises you get surprised every single day so i use the gmfm as i don't use the entire scale and scoring to keep tabs i use these single single components to uh, you know break it down and it is easier for the parent to also understand because parents always have bigger expectations like direct sitting standing walking they forget that so many steps are there in between also so when the child starts doing that it's is good so you can use that gmfm is very good as i said sensory profile is a very very good tool because it also helps you to understand about the adl of the child because in everyday activities there are certain uh, like sensory issues say avoidance of certain textures when the baby has lots of feeding issues no you also notice that certain they are averse to certain textures of food and they that child is also showing aversion to certain textures of clothes or socks or hair cutting nail cutting so these things if the child is just constantly crying and not allowing these so many things you can think oh is it the tactile system is it the tactile system which is a problem because he is showing so many characteristics like this it can be related to sound so like i can go on and actually this session is really like uh, there is so much more to share but i've tried to just you know cover a little gist of it to give you an insight into all of these domains but yeah definitely uh, like if to answer your question we can say gmfm and sensory profile are excellent to set session goals okay so thank you for that answer uh, i can i can see the passion coming through um just one one very last question i think a part of it we did cover in uh, one of the previous uh, aspects that you covered but i would still want you to elaborate a little bit on how do you go about gaining confidence of the parent um yes. since they are an active member of the uh, rehab process and in fact um, a lot of things depend on how much do they believe in the capacity of physiotherapy to work so um i would like you to help us uh, with that yeah okay so uh, what my process is no like i don't break the entire news on day 1 what i do is i explain first to them because many a times by the time the parent has come to physiotherapy they are not aware of the full extent of damage that the child is dealing so if it's a hemiplegic child or if it's an autistic child whatever it may be okay they don't know what that condition itself looks like or how these people get integrated into the uh, eventual society so what i do is i explain the condition to them i explain what difficulties he is likely to face when he is 10 year old or when he is 15 year old as a teenager what will be there right now in infancy and toddler age what is going to happen so and when they see and i say i always explain them okay right now i am working on this particular thing let him sit let him uh, start using his hands for function so when i work on those small uh, goals i have my session goals in mind when i select uh, like when i start with the therapy session so i i just say let let us go for a month with this goal in mind and see where he goes so when i'm working on uh, these conditions in that one month the parent observes what we are, how we are working on it and because we have explained to them we are not giving them unrealistic expectations right at day one but at the same time we are not saying ki abhi kuch hone hi nahi wala hai so that balance if you maintain and you uh start with a lot of genuine you should respect their fears sometimes many times the parents cry because they are in that denial phase that okay why has my child only got so and so and this thing so i have to also instill that belief in them that you can do it i emphasize a lot on home program what simple things they can do at home and many times that happens is i'm working on certain things in the session the child is crying it's not happening and i tell okay at home what all you have can you send me activity videos of the child in his environment i try to uh, learn about the child's environment at home because i am a stranger for the child so it will take some time for me to gain the child's trust but if i empower the parents in such a way i tell them what to observe so uh, many as i said walking standing these are bigger goals but certain certain uh sorry certain subtle improvements start happening even in first few sessions and when they see that their hope and their trust is instilled that okay if we go step wise like this yes my child is showing changes 
I invariably give them a lot of home program. So even severely involved kids know I like to see them three or four times in a week myself. Rest days are the parents' homework. I give them a lot of homework and they start enjoying that process because they themselves feel, oh, I did this and they come back to me in the next session with the positive outcome. I encourage them to take a lot of home videos also. So there is a serial recording of where we started to where we have reached. And yeah, it will be uh, like there will be some bumps along the way. But uh, more or less they get there eventually there are certain parents who definitely leave therapy they go into a depressive phase then they come back after a few months you have to be understanding of that also not every parent is also the same so yes you have to give it to them it's it's extremely difficult being parents of special kids it's extremely difficult being a parent only but yeah when there's a special kids with uh, such challenges yes it takes a toll on the family we have to come from a place of empathy for that Right. Thank you so much um, for the wonderful interactive session that you had with me. And um, I would like to uh, extend my warm wishes to you. All the very best for your future. And may you be able to uh, bring a difference in the lives of many such uh, children in the future. So um, all the best to you for that. And it was a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. It was great for me also. Um, as, as you can tell, sometimes like in my hurry, but I, I, it's like there is so much that I want to share about this. I want more and more awareness about how you can positively impact quality of life in neuro patients, adult, repeats, any, any patient for that matter. So I really want this awareness to spread about early action for getting maximum uh, positive outcomes in the patient. So, yes, uh, I hope this uh, serves as a platform to create that awareness in not just us as physiotherapists, but in all members of specialty. So, anyone who is in contact with a child can be an active member and identify and, you know, direct the, them to take the necessary services to make a difference. We all can contribute to that. Thank you so much and thank you Sanchiti College and you, uh, Dr. Rucha. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, a big thank you to the team of Physio TV for organizing this session and helping us reach out to the masses. And I'd like to conclude here. So good day, everyone. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye. Take care.